Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Kern. I'm the director of the Yadnada Center for Indian Studies, and I'm really happy to see such a large and uh, robust group here uh, from a variety of different uh, constituencies. I see faculty, I see members of the community, I see some high school students here from AP World History. You're all raised your hand. Let's see the high school teachers raise your hand. High school teachers, not students. <laughs> there we go. You're part of our Teach India program, and now the students. Excellent. Welcome. We have, we have sort of a, a, a hierarchy here. Teachers before students. No, <laughs> um, I'd like to thank a few people, as usual, for making this event uh, happen. Uh, I always like to thank the caterers because the food was excellent, was it not? Yeah. Uh, if you've not been to Kamal Palace, they would like you to come to the Kamal Palace, right? So if you don't know where that is, look it up. Um, and what I like about the Kamal Palace is that they're timely and they're always here on time. And so I appreciate that. Um, I'd also like to thank some uh, graduate students from the history department who have been helpful about setting up. I think they're still all out there. Are the grad students here? There they are. They're eating. Okay. Thank you, grad students. And I'd very much like to thank uh, Mahir Pandya from the anthropology department who's been helping out this semester with the uh, uh, Yadnanda Center. Mahir, you want to stand up? And of course, most importantly, I'd like to thank Buka and Melanie Solanke, whose generous endowment for the Adnana Center makes all these types of events uh, happen. And without their support, we couldn't have these wonderful events. Could you take, could you stand up for a bit, So the center's been very busy this year. We've had a lot of events, um, and people are, uh, I was trained as a, I'm a historian, I'm currently I'm running the secondary credential program at College of Ed. People are always like, oh, you always have history talks, you know? And I'm like, well, I like history. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but this year, I think we've, we've kind of opened up. We've had, um, Mahir Sharma was here, who gave a talk on the, uh, he's from the uh, uh, journalist and from Delhi, who uh, gave a talk on the Indian economy. Um, Mugda Yolakar from LMU gave a talk on contemporary religious practices in Maha uh, Maharashtra. We had Martha Shelby here from the University of Texas, oh, who gave a really yeah. interesting talk yes. on the uh, short stories of uh, Dilip Kumar, uh, Tamil short stories. So we had a, a literature talk. Uh, we had a dance performance from uh, Kerala uh, in the spring. And we had a talk from Sarah Tamang from uh, Kathmandu uh, about the sort of uh, political situation uh, affecting uh, particularly women in uh, think Martha, uh, Nepal. So this year we've had a, a lot of different it's disciplines uh, represented by our uh, various yes. activities. Um, and the talk today, She's I think, as you'll see, is very interesting. I think it's both sort of historical and contemporary um, at the same time. We've also been busy this year with our Teach India project, which continues. We're doing workshops uh, with teachers, working with them about how to uh, appropriately incorporate India in the way that they teach world history. Uh, ensuring that they're teaching India in the context of world history, not just to create sort of dispositional attachment and enthusiasm for India, but also recognizing the significance of India in the context of world history, and also seeing the significance of, his, of India in world history from a, 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 a grounded in scholarship, in the new scholarship um, of world history in particular. So we ran a workshop in uh, Long Beach, and two days of the workshop were in the Jain Temple, and. Uh, uh, Buena Park, and then now we've got some support, not just from the center, but also some support from the Rivera Foundation and the uh, Hindu American yeah. Federation. We're actually running the same workshop on the East Coast. So we have a West Coast and East Coast version, and the East Coast version we run at the uh, Shiva Vishnu Temple in Atlanta, Maryland. So that's been very interesting to work with teachers on the East Coast and also teachers on the West Coast. Teachers on the West Coast is better. <laughs> I had to say that. Any event, before I uh, introduce our speaker, I'd like to ask the um, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts to come up and say a few words, and then the Chair of the History Department. This is David Wallace. David. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the California State University of Long Beach on behalf of the College of Liberal Arts. I bring you greetings from my president, Jane Conley, who is on some sort of crazy tour of events today. 
presents her regrets that she could not make it. Although I'm kind of happy she didn't make it because that means I get to speak to you. <laughs> and this is quite frankly one of my favorite events of the year. It's really a signature event for this college. And although he's very generous about sharing the credit with lots of other folks, we all need to thank Tim Kern for all the work that he does. <laughs> One reason that I look forward to this event each year is that my own education largely ignored in Rio. I grew up in a little town in western Pennsylvania of 3,000 people. And I think it's fair to say that my elementary and high school education was not exactly infused with global perspectives. <laughs> However, as I look back over my four post-secondary degrees, I don't see nearly enough emphasis on India and the subcontinent given their important historical and global roles. And so one of the reasons I look forward to this event is I get to fill in some of the gaps in my own education. And for that reason, I'm just so delighted that we have both students and teachers involved in the Teach India uh, project here. The other reason that I really like this event is because it's what a university should be about, about bringing together faculty, students, community members to hear what I'm sure will be a fascinating lecture on a topic of mutual interest. This is the sort of thing that a university can and should do. And finally today, I want to say that quite literally, we all would not be sitting here today if it were not for the generosity of the Solanke family. And I want to add my personal thanks to Uka and Nalini for their generous support for this event. Thank you. And now, David Schaefer from the history department is going to say a few words. I don't need to run up to the microphone. No, you don't have to. Sure. Wow, well, thank you for seeing my thunder, Dean Wallace. Um, as Dean Wallace expressed, I would like to extend my thanks to the Solanke family, to Luca and Nalini, for their very, very generous support of the Yatnanian Center, especially to Ken for his directorship of it. Uh, this has expanded the consciousness of our students of India, the most important part of the world. It's increased their curiosity, it's exposed them to Indian culture. And the program that I have to say that Tim has organized has shown the diversity of life in Indian culture in India, truly Indian studies at its best. So um, again, I want to ex express my thanks uh, to the Solanke family and to Tim Kirk for uh, uh, organizing this event and the other events uh, as well. Thank you. So um, it's my pleasure then to introduce uh, this, this year's speaker. This is the 15th uh, Solanke lecture. So that's uh, a monumental uh, date in that regard. And we've invited, and she's accepted our invitation, Ananya Vashpai, to come here. And she's come all the way from Delhi. In fact, I can believe you were in the United States two weeks ago, flew home and came back. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so um, she's from the Center for Developing Studies in New, Devel in New Delhi, where she's a professor and fellow. Uh, she received her master's degree from uh, JNU, and she's got degrees from pretty much all over the world. She was a Rhodes Scholar and has a master's degree from Oxford, and then she got her PhD from right here in the United States at the uh, University of Chicago. So that's quite a pedigree, JNU, Oxford, um, and the University of Chicago. Very impressive. Um, she's also held visiting professorships all around the world. Uh, she's had a visiting professorship in Columbia, uh, at Columbia University, New York City, University of Massachusetts in Boston, and wonderful place to be, University of Venice in uh, Italy. <laughs> very, very nice. I and her publishing record is, is really outstanding. Lots of articles, lots of essays, but most important is her book, uh, Righteous Republic, The Political Foundations of Modern India, which was published by Harvard University Press in 2012 and won all sorts of awards. It was Book of the Year listed by The Guardian in the UK, by The New Republic in the United States, uh, Tata Book of the Year Award um, in India. Um, shameless plug, if you'd like a copy, and I highly recommend it, we have them for sale uh, for $20 um, after the talk. And they're signed, I believe. Um, she's widely published in a, in a, in a variety of uh, important newspapers and op-eds. She uh, publishes regularly in the Hindu, in India, and in Foreign Affairs, World Policy Journal, 
and she's also to be found periodically um, in the New York Times. Her talk, I think, today is really <coughs> timely um, on Ambedkar. I, I personally, I, I've always found Ambedkar to be a fascinating figure in terms of his life story, which I'm sure she'll share, right? But as someone who uh, ends up with a PhD from the London School of Economics and from uh, Columbia, and having gone to the LSE, I like to think of him as a, a fellow alumni. Um, it's a fascinating life story, and then her lecture today is part of a larger project where she's writing a biography of Ambedkar. And the title of her talk, The Difficulty of Being Equal, Bed, uh, Bedkar and His Struggle with India, um, I think is timely because I think we're also discovering in India that India is having uh, some difficulty in having a struggle with Ambedkar himself. And I think she'll be talking about that as well. So I think what's interesting about her talk is it, it's both historical, but also thinking about how someone like Ambedkar is uh, understood and represented um, in the present. So this is a talk that's both historical, but yes, also focuses on uh, contemporary context. So it's my pleasure, right, to ask Anya, Ananya Vanpai to come up and give the 15th Slonky lecture. Thank you. And we will have Q&A after the lecture. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, thank you so much. Um, thank you, uh, Tim. Thanks, Mihir. Thanks to the Solankis. And thank, thank you to, to everyone who's here tonight uh, to, to, um, to make this uh, journey that uh, we're about to go on for the next uh, hour and a half. Um, just going to put my timer on here. So I've been thinking about how to um, how to give this talk. Um, as Tim indicated, I'm trying to write uh, an intellectual biography um, of Ambedkar, and this is. Uh, you know, I'm writing about his life. It's probably going to take me my whole life to, to get it written. Um, and so I, I've been working on this for many, many years already. And I have gone through many different aspects of his life, many different phases uh, in my own understanding um, of his very diverse and complex uh, political work and his many intellectual achievements. Um, and so at different points in time, I, I'm interested in different aspects of Ambedkar myself. And I'm quite focused uh, for the moment on this problem of equality and inequality. Um, so I'm going to talk about that for today. And this will not, you know, having this focus means that I, I cannot be comprehensive and tell you everything about him that that I could possibly tell you um, in, in, in some other context. Um, you'll have to wait for the book for that. Um, so Ambedkar um, was born in 1891, died in 1956. And he's possibly one of the most, if not the most, interesting figures in the political life of modern India uh, in the colonial and, and post-colonial period. Um, He's unusual in many ways, and um, quite frankly, understudied and not well understood even to, to this day. Um, so many years, so many decades after his death, and so many 70 years after India's independence. Um, and nowadays, uh, you'll see his name bandied about a great deal, uh, because there is, an, there is some understanding that he is important. Uh, even if, if there's very little clarity on why exactly and what to make of him. Um, so um, he's often talked about in um, sort of half-baked ways uh, or um, uh, in, in, you know, in shallow ways or sometimes um, mis misrepresented. Um, and so it's, it's important to cut through all of that to, 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 to really get down to what it is that he means for us and why he's so important. Um, Ambedkar is known as at least two or three different uh, personae. 
Um, he is the leader of the Untouchables, uh, formerly known as Untouchables, the Dalit community uh, for modern purposes, um, the sort of lowest of the low in the Indian caste system. Um, and uh, he, he, for the first time, provides and defines a political identity for this community in the modern era. Um, that's one of the ways in which we know him. He's also founding father of the Indian Republic. Um, he was the chairman of the drafting committee of the Indian Constitution, which was promulgated in 1950. Um, he's not the author of the Constitution, but he had a big role to play in the kind of Constitution that the Republic of India, a secular socialist democratic republic with equal citizenship, uh, with universal adult franch franchise, the largest democracy in the world. Um, the shape of that and the foundations of that document uh, have a lot to do with Ambedkar's um, authorship or supervision of, th of the collective authorship of this document. Um, he was also, and this is something that is less known about him, uh, the founder, right before his death, um, of a new sect of Protestant reform neo-Buddhism. Um, so he's also the leader of a religious sect. Um, which is something that um, is not as emphasized when he's usually talked about. Uh, it's the first two identities that, that are more, um, you know, on people's minds. Um, but this actually turns out to be, uh, the, you know, the, 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 his intervention in religion and his religious conversion of himself and of uh, half a million Dalits um, right before his death and his writing of this, um, what he called the Buddhist Bible, uh, a monumental work uh, under the title of the Buddha and his Dhamma, um, this actually turns out to be a very, very important clue to Ambedkar's lifelong struggle with the problem of equality. Now, Ambedkar, I'll just tell you very quickly, um, I'm, I'm sure many of you know this from many of the people I was introduced to uh, before we began, it was clear that Many of you are familiar with India um, professionally, personally, have traveled there, so I don't need to go into great detail, perhaps. Um, but Ambedkar came from very modest, humble beginnings. Uh, he did belong to an untouchable community. Uh, he had some slight advantage in that his father worked for the British Army, so he had access to schooling, um, and he was able to um, go get a primary and a, and a secondary education. He was also very brilliant from a very early age uh, and was helped by his teachers and by various benefactors. Um, and uh, in this way, completely unusually, and actually as a first for someone of his background, of the Mahar caste uh, of, of Western India, of Maharashtra, um, um, coming from an untouchable background, he nonetheless um, studied in the city of Bombay and then won a scholarship to Columbia University um, right before the beginning of World War I. Um, this was an absolute first for anyone of his description at that time uh, in, in India. Um, and he went on to study uh, political economy um, at Columbia and anthropology. Um, he studied with uh, the great American liberal philosopher, pragmatist, thinker, great educationist John Dewey. Uh, who was actually associated with the University of Chicago, but happened to be spending some time at Columbia when Ambedkar was a student there. Uh, and this remained a lifelong influence on uh, Ambedkar's thinking about democracy, about education, and about um, um, the importance of um, a certain kind of democratic <laughs> culture in, in, in social and public life. And I'll go on to talk about that a little bit. Uh, so Ambedkar earned um, you know, a, a PhD um, again a first, very quickly, he was very, very driven, very motivated and very short on money um, and came from extremely straightened circumstances. Um, he went on to the London School of Economics, earned a second PhD, um, earned a law degree from Gray's Inn in London, his most ridiculously overqualified uh, young man, um, tried to get a third PhD if you can believe this. Uh, at the University of Bonn in Oriental Studies and Indology. Um, because actually, uh, the systematic scholarly study of 
the Indian past and of classical texts in Sanskrit, in Pali, the language of ancient Buddhism. This was something that was a lifelong interest and where he went on to write a great deal uh, in these areas, but he wasn't able to get that third PhD. He finally ran out of money and time uh, and had to come back to India. Um, so when he began his uh, public political career uh, in India, in Bombay, uh, in the mid-1920s, uh, he, in, he initially started as, with a legal practice and as a law professor. Um, and um, at that time, this was sort of the uh, heyday uh, of um, nationalist anti-colonial politics in India. Uh, Gandhi had returned to India, Mahatma Gandhi had returned to India in uh, 1915. And by 1919, 1920, he had launched many of his first uh, mass campaigns uh, for um, sort of anti-colonial agitations. Uh, he had already introduced the idea of nonviolent uh, protest, of civil disobedience, of non-cooperation. Uh, and his entire kind of repertoire of, um, of new political strategies uh, to um, stand up, for Indians to stand up to uh, British colonial rule and to British Empire. Um, and Gandhi was uh, the dominant figure uh, in, in, in mass politics as well as in the sort of intellectual, political, uh, social milieu at the time when Ambedkar as a young man uh, first stepped in uh, to public life in Bombay in the mid-1920s. Um, and here's where uh, I want to introduce this theme of equality. So what was happening in India, and I've written a whole book about this, um, you know, between the 1880s, right up to independence in 1947, and in fact, the coming into being of the constitution in 1950, that entire period of, of just short of a, of a century, uh, late 19th, early, for, you know, first half of the 20th century, the dominant political project that consumed the entire Indian political public sphere uh, was the project of uh, India attaining its own sovereignty, political independence from British rule, right? The project of Swaraj. Swaraj literally means self-rule. So the idea was to replace British Raj, British rule, with Swaraj, self-rule, uh, and for India to become an independent uh, entity uh, as it turned out, a nation state, a democratic nation state, to stop being a subject uh, of the British Empire. And a lot of what was going on in intellectual life, in political life, historical events, uh, throughout this period, through the First and the Second World War, um, in India, uh, that was the sort of collective focus. Um, and it's been described to death by historians of modern India. Um, and uh, you know, it, 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 it is the story that is told about the making of India uh, as, as we know it to be today, as, as, as the world's largest democracy and so on. For Ambedkar, being politically active and intellectually increasingly influential in this period of time through the 20s, 30s, 40s, and up to his death in the mid 50s, there was an obvious synergy with this larger consuming collective political project towards Swaraj. But Ambedkar also kept his own agenda um, vital and central as far as his own work was concerned. And this was the question of equality. So it wasn't just important that India be free from British rule, from colonial domination, but also that Indian society in itself be able to free itself internally of its long traditions of hierarchy, inequality, oppression, various kinds of exclusion and marginalization of women, uh, of uh, uh, lower castes, um, and that that kind of internal housekeeping be as important and as much front and center as the external, externally oriented project of uh, trying to uh, get rid of 
uh, foreign domination and British rule. Right? The two things, according to Ambedkar, had to be in parallel because otherwise it would only be a question of replacing um, one kind of oppression with another. Right? If, if, if Indian elites, if upper castes, if men alone, if only members of certain communities were going to capture power from the British and then continue to dominate uh, the greater mass of the population, uh, that would not be a full freedom. That would not be a true sovereignty and a truly democratic form of self-rule. All of the selves of, of this, this the very diverse and very large uh, entity that we've come to call India had to be part of that fight, had to be part of that struggle, and that's what Ambedkar wanted to keep front and center. Now, it wasn't always the case. In fact, it was very rarely the case that he had much uptake for his agenda from the larger political surrounding. Um, the struggle against British rule, to the extent that it was gu guided by Gandhi and the Congress party, uh, the Indian National Congress, um, was focused on the idea of nonviolent struggle um, and um, use these techniques, as I said, of non-cooperation and of civil disobedience, satyagra, uh, very effectively. So initially, as a kind of initial learning by watching Gandhi be so successful politically, Ambedkar tried to apply those same techniques to the problem of caste, to the problem of hierarchy, to the problem of inequality. So his first campaigns, his first political campaigns in the late 1920s consisted in him leading untouchable groups of untouchables, communities of untouchables, into, for example, temples where they were not allowed to enter and pray. Having them drink water and draw water from communal tanks and wells where they were not allowed to touch the water because their touch was considered polluting uh, by upper castes. Right? So he introduced the idea of, a, of the public of public spaces, of public goods, of the commons, and of civic and civil rights uh, as being potentially resources that were accessible to all Indians, not just to upper caste, not just to the wealthy, and so on. Right? And the way he tried to build those campaigns was following Gandhi, uh, uh, taking the form of civil disobedience. So refusing to obey caste rules which prevented you from drinking the water, refusing to uh, respect the strictures which disallowed you from trying to enter a temple and to pray there, and so on. And Ambedkar engaged in these campaigns um, for a number of years, I would say from, from mid-20s to the mid-30s. Um, and he did not meet with much success. Because even though he was able to mobilize untouchables to follow him on these campaigns, what he often found was that as soon as they turned around and left, caste Hindus would move in and, for example, try to purify a body of water where they had just drunk water from, right, to remove the ritual pollution, right? So, uh, I mean, it was kind of a zero-sum achievement in the sense that they'd managed to drink the water, but, but the rules of the game had not changed. There was no real acceptance, there was no understanding that they had a right to drink that water, that that water ought to be available to them just as to anybody else because of their fundamental human dignity um, and, and, a, and, a, and a basic sense of equality and respect that ought to obtain. Similarly, with temple entry, uh, eventually he had to take the battle to the courts. Um, he had to actually fight it out in court because what uh, groups controlling these temples, upper caste groups, uh, were saying was this temple is private property. It's not that we're not letting you enter because you're untouchable or because you're this caste or that caste. Frankly, it's private property and we're only going to allow who we want in here and, you know, we don't want you in here. And if you want to violate or trespass, then we're going to take you to court. Um, and Ambedkar had to fight so hard and so long that he began to lose faith that it was actually possible to make a sort of moral appeal or even a political rational appeal uh, to the Hindu community uh, to set aside their um, weddedness 
uh, to uh, uh, caste discrimination and to these deep prejudices against uh, uh, marginalized communities, backward castes, depressed castes, uh, untouchables, and so on. Um, at that point, Ambedkar began to think about other ways to address this question of, of uh, e equality and inequality. And in the early mid 1930s, it began to be clear because of the negotiations between the British government and the Congress, the Indian National Congress, and Gandhi, led by figures like Gandhi and Nehru and so on. It began to be clear that there was going to be a partial devolution of power, that there was going to be some degree of self determination, that the British were going to relax this absolute hold that they had on India in response to these long decades of, of struggle uh, and that there were going to be uh, elections um, in, in, in 1936. Right? There was a Government of India Act which was a kind of precursor uh, to, to eventual independence in 1935 and it began to be clear that some parts of India were going to look at partial self-governance. So Ambedkar now thought about how should his people enter into um, the process of representative democracy? How should they begin to constitute themselves as participants in a quasi-democratic process, in an emerging democratic process? Right? How should they run for elections? How should they be elected? How should they become part of these legislatures which were now going to have Indian representatives for the first time? Right? In what way should they represent themselves to the British uh, as constituting a community with certain claims, uh, with certain demands, and with certain expectations of their rights being respected? Um, and he started thinking in terms of proportional representation, in terms of separate electorates, in terms of constituting untouchables as a political minority, um, which needed political representation as such because of the kind of issues that untouchables face, which caste Hindus did not face, or which other uh, members of other religious groups, for example, Muslims, uh, you know, they had their own issues. So he wanted to create that kind of a separate identity and to have it count in this new emerging political process. And at that point, Gandhi put his foot down and said um, that, you know, we need to constant, we need, we have a common enemy. The common enemy is, is the white man, is, is British Raj. And if we break down the aggregate of the Hindu community, into upper and lower castes, into untouchables and caste Hindus. You know, if we basically farm out, uh, uh, you know, representation uh, as though untouchables were not Hindus, but some kind of a separate political identity with its own, um, uh, you know, uh, its, its, its own pr proportion, its own kind of minority status, that would be fracturing um, the community, the religious community of the Hindus uh, and, and reducing their bargaining power vis-a-vis uh, -vis this foreign ruler. So he wanted Ambedkar to remain within the Hindu fold, as it were, even though as Hindus, untouchables were not treated uh, well by, by caste Hindus. Right? So that question of internal inequality being what it was, Gandhi still preferred that all Hindus stick together in the face of a common enemy. Right? And Ambedkar was arm twisted into agreeing to this, but he became very disgusted with the kind of rationale that led to this kind of demand being made on him. Uh, and Gandhi at the time went on a famous fast. Um, basically, he said that he would not break his fast un unless Ambedkar agreed um, to whatever terms he was setting. Um, and, and Ambedkar had no choice, Gandhi being the kind of leader that he was, and they, they entered into this pact called the Pune Pact. Um, but although Ambedkar, you know, acquiesced, it also made him certain that the problem of inequality could not be addressed uh, within um, the traditional conservative contours of the way in which Hindu society defined itself. There was always going to be um, this kind of hierarchy. There was always going to be this kind of um, high and low 
uh, and and uh, untouchables would basically have to stay in their place if they were to remain within the Hindu fold. So at that point in 1935, he made a public declaration. He said, I was born a Hindu, but I will not die a Hindu. Now, he didn't know really himself what this means exactly. You know, in the Hindu scheme of things, there is no way to become a Hindu. Uh, there's no conversion. You can't stop being a Hindu. You can't start being a Hindu. You're just born into your caste, into your community, into your uh, you know, locality and into your family. And, and there's no understanding of how to uh, switch in and out of this position that you have in the world uh, as, as, a, as a religious identity. But Ambedkar went out on a limb and made this declaration that somehow he was not going to accept this second class citizenship within the Hindu fold. What he was exactly going to do, he did not say until 20 years later. After this, he did run for elections, he did win, he did become a, a, a legislator, uh, you know, he joined the government, uh, the partial, partial uh, Indian British government uh, that, that continued through the late 30s and the early 40s. And because of his juridical knowledge, because of his legal uh, scholarship, uh, because of his political experience, because of all his degrees, um, he was a kind of unique figure uh, in the political landscape at the time. Uh, and he also undertook systematic investigations in book form of a number of subjects. So he wrote a book about Muslims in India and partition. The possibility of partition appeared on the horizon already uh, by around 1942-43, uh, and he started to think about this very seriously. If Muslims could be a minority, why couldn't untouchables be a minority? If South Asian Muslims or British Indian Muslims could think about having their own country, did untouchables really need their own country? Was, was, were they going to follow that model? Was that going to be the logic? Or did that not really work for a variety of reasons? Right? Who are untouchables? Historically, how have they even come to exist as a form of uh, social life uh, on the Indian subcontinent? Why is there such extreme discrimination? How are certain professions uh, uh, discriminated against and stigmatized to the extent that uh, there is bodily harm uh, to be visited upon those who are born untouchables? What is the long history of this kind of segregation and hierarchy in, in South Asian cultures? Right? Um, how are untouchables different from other kinds of lower caste groups? Um, and what is the distinct history of those groups? Uh, that they are somehow more within um, the purview of caste society, while untouchables are completely and entirely excluded. What are those differences? He wrote books about each of these subjects. Um, and, and you know the body of his scholarship is really quite humongous, which is why it's taking someone like me such a long time. Uh, to, to write an intellectual biography. Um, uh, around 1946, it became clear that India was indeed going to be partitioned uh, and that two new nation states were going to emerge, India and Pakistan. How exactly that would happen was very unclear. As you know, it was a very violent uh, process. It was probably the largest displacement of human populations in the history of the modern world. Um, there were more deaths and more displacements than in the Holocaust, than in World War II in Europe. Um, but of course, this is something that South Asians are still coming to terms with, and that um, you know, facing that, facing what partition actually meant uh, for a for an independent struggle that had for decades defined itself as nonviolent, to end up in this in this kind of bloody birth. Uh, is something that, that you know, in Indians and Pakistanis have still to, and Bangladeshis now, um, you know, have still to, to come to terms with. But at any rate, uh, in 1946, uh, the Constituent Assembly was uh, created, was called. Uh, and they took three years uh, to write the Constitution from 1946 to 49. Independence was already declared in August 1947. 
uh, on 14th, 15th August when India and Pakistan both became independent nation states. So Ambedkar was very much a part of the Constituent Assembly. He was appointed as the chairman of the drafting committee, again because of his extraordinary legal knowledge and co competence. And he studied very carefully. Now again, his concern here was less with the process of gaining independence, which was the concern of others like Gandhi, Nehru, etc., and Jinnah, uh, and many, 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 many others. His concern was, what is the shape that this constitutional document is going to take? So he studied the, Brit you know, the British parliamentary system, the French Revolution and the French Constitution, the American Revolution and the American Constitution, the Japanese, the Irish. He studied all these Western liberal democracies in great detail, juridically, legally, historically, politically. And he tried to ensure that the best principles of liberal democracy, liberty, equality, fraternity, certainly, but also ideas of universal adult franchise, equal citizenship, vote from the get-go in all other countries, in all other democracies of the world, the vote was won slowly by different sectors of society. It was only men, it was only the landed and the property classes, it was only the whites, and so on and so on. But by the end of a long process, you had uh, everyone voting. Not so in India. From the get-go, from day zero, men and women, of a certain age, people of all castes, all classes, all ethnicities, all languages, all religions, all races, if they were Indian citizens, they had the vote. They had the right to vote. They had the citizenship to begin with. So Ambedkar, in part, was responsible for this kind of um, absolute embrace of the idea of equality and putting it at the center of of, of, of the Indian constitutional structure and the foundations of the Indian Republic. Um, but he also put in, very importantly, both he and Nehru together put in um, the first structures of affirmative action, of positive discrimination, of social justice. Why? Because he was still thinking about the problem of inequality. And in his last address to the Indian Constituent Assembly in, in November 1949, he said, what we have seen in India is nothing short of a political revolution, even though unlike the revolutions in, in, in Russia and in, in many other parts of the world, uh, it, it's not been um, you know, a revolutionary achievement of independence. It's been a relatively peaceful transfer of power and it's been decolonization rather than a revolution. We never quite had a revolution in India. Nonetheless, the political transformation of India from being a colony, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire, uh, to becoming a constitutional liberal democracy overnight is nothing short of revolutionary. That transformation, the political transformation, is a revolutionary political transformation. But have we had a concomitant social revolution? No, absolutely not. We see no signs of it. We still see extreme suspicion, hatred, bigotry against minorities, uh, minority Muslims in that case, especially on the, on the sort of at the dawn of partition on, and, and, and you know, on, on, or at the very moment of, 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 of the creation of these two nations. Um, and we see the, 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 the structure of the caste system, which is what defines Indian social and cultural uh, life. That has remained intact through this politically revolutionary decolonization. Right? And he said it right there to the Constituent Assembly that, that we have to, there is a lag. Our project, our work is not done even though we are formally promulgating the Constitution in January 1950 and India will be reborn as a constitutional democratic republic. Our work is only half done. In fact, the work is only just begun. And we should treat this constitution as a warrant to consider that pending problem of social inequality, which is always dogging us, which means that even though each of us has the vote, even though each of us is an equal citizen, we know that that equality is incomplete and unreal, that it's not going to be realized for 
the millions who uh, do not form part of the upper echelons of society, who do not control social, political, and who historically have not controlled uh, social, political power. Right? So he put in, with, with Nehru's help, the first um, sort of arrangements for positive discrimination for affirmative action, the reservations policy, and ensured that the state look out specially for marginal groups, for backward groups, for depressed groups, and make that extra effort to level the playing field, which was not going to happen simply by political fiat, which was not going to happen simply because everyone could vote. right? Now, his thinking at the time, and that of Nehru, who was the first prime minister of independent India, was that this is all temporary. In about 10 years, they felt things would level out. True equality would begin. Because whatever the backlog, whatever the historical injustices, whatever the kind of burdens of the past, of the caste system coming down centuries, those would be dealt with institutionally, in education, and employment, in all of the institutions of the state. Um, essentially, those who were left behind would have time to catch up. And then the real work of, of democratic nation building would begin. This was not to be. 70 years today after independence, uh, the scope of affirmative action is ever expanding um, because that lag is far from filled. Those gaps are far from filled. And more and more and more people uh, are, in fact, needing to enter the system, but still needing help to enter the system because um, political equality and, and electoral democracy, even though it's working well in India relative to many other parts of the world, um, is not getting them their rights, is not getting them the access and the opportunities and the, the resources that they need uh, to live a life of, of dignity and, and prosperity. Right? So in a sense, Ambedkar sensed that. He sensed he saw it coming. He said, political revolution has to be accompanied by social revolution. It has not happened. OK, let's at least take the first steps in this direction. He was appointed the first law minister in Nehru's cabinet. And the first thing that he and Nehru did together was cobble together this bill that they wanted to pass in parliament called the Hindu Code Bill, which was going to reform uh, Hindu society by reforming laws around marriage, property, inheritance, and all these kinds of things as ways to modernize the Hindu community, which is the majority community uh, in, 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 uh, in modern India, post-partition, um, to try and alleviate the worst aspects of caste-based inequality, uh, and also deal with issues around women's rights, uh, extreme patriarchy and various other kinds of sort of you know pathologies that had uh, basically attached themselves to this historically very very old uh, religious community. Um, so they formulated this Hindu Code Bill, which was essentially a, 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 an effort at, at social reform through the mechanisms of the state, um, and the bill completely failed in Parliament. Uh, all of the progressive uh, leaders of the Congress, uh, you know, of the left parties, uh, the socialists, the Democrats, uh, you know, all of the sort of founding generations of our, our parliamentarians, um, when it really came push to shove, uh, they were not really interested in, in the reform of Hindu society, where it affected the most intimate aspects of uh, religious life, community identity, uh, and especially gender relations. Um, they wanted Ambedkar and Nehru to go slow, right? Equality is a good thing, but not too much of it. Um, so this kind of conservative reaction sort of kicked in. Post-independence, the problem is no longer the British. The problem is no longer the colonial master. This is now an internal debate where Ambedkar is unable to make headway. And yet again, he was so disgusted that he resigned his position as a law minister. And he quit the government. And he said, you know, here we are. I've been in this game for, for 30 years. 
everything that had to be done, we have done. We are independent, we are demo, you know, democratic nation state, and yet caste is exactly where it was. And even as the law minister, even as a writer of this constitution, he wasn't able to uh, push through the reforms that, that he felt were necessary. At that point, he took the last of his many approaches to the problem of inequality, which was that he turned back to that problem that he had identified in 1935 and he said, I will not die a Hindu. And he started to think around 1950-51. OK, so if I were to not be a Hindu, what would I be? And what can we do to reform the Hindus as a religious identity, as a modern religious identity? If we cannot reform them, if we leave them, what would we become? Now, Article 17 of the Constitution abolished untouchability, made it legally, morally, politically intolerable and unacceptable. It was no longer a thing that was recognized. But that didn't mean that extreme forms of social discrimination had gone away. This is the lesson that Ambedkar learned. So he said, time to stop being a Hindu, because only inside the Hindu caste system are we going to be forever discriminated against in this way. And so he started a dialogue with leaders of the Muslim community, leaders of the Christian community, leaders of the Sikh community. They made representations to him and they said, come to us. Because all religions are more egalitarian by comparison. And all these religions have existed historically on the subcontinent for as long as they have existed in the world. There have been Muslims in India from the dawn of Islam. There have been Christians in India, Jews in India from the dawn of Christianity and Judaism. Sikhism, Buddhism, Jainism, these are Indic religions. All these traditions, there are Parsis, pre-Islamic Persians in India, Zoroastrians. There are numerous tribal faiths uh, and sects. There's any number of options. So all of the major world religions that were represented within the Indian spectrum, everyone came to Ambedkar and said, become Muslim, become Christian, become Sikh. You'll be better off than being untouchable Hindus. Um, and he thought about this carefully. And for various reasons, which I've written about again in my book already, um, he finally came to the conclusion that it would not work to become Muslim, because we had just had a partition on that very principle uh, of the two nation theory. It would not work to become Christian, because the departed colonial masters were Christians. Uh, and, and part of the colonial project had to do with Christianity um, uh, and capitalism. So that would not look good. Um, and Sikhism was a very small religion, um, very, very small, had also suffered deeply uh, during the partition violence. You know, the Sikhs had been displaced in the Punjab in a very big way. So he finally decided to turn to Buddhism. Now, Buddhism is an ancient Indic faith. It was born in India. It was a faith that existed in India for a good thousand years before traveling out into other parts of Asia and the world, but more or less petered out as an important force within India itself. Um, nonetheless, in the 20th century, there were a number of Protestant and Neo-Buddhist movements going on all over India, in the West, in, in, in England, in Sri Lanka, in Thailand, in Bhutan, in Cambodia, in Burma, in Nepal, in everywhere, not, not so much in, 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 in China because, because we had already had the, you know, the, 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 you know the, the, the Maoism had come to China. Cultural Revolution came to China in the 20th century. But in other parts of the world, uh, there was a serious attempt to rethink this ancient faith of Buddhism. And Buddhism having been born in India and having arisen in the first place with the Buddha as a re rebel figure against ancient Vedic Hindu society, which was already caste society in deep, deep Indic anti antiquity. Um, the figure of the Buddha appealed to Ambedkar as a revolutionary figure, as a figure who was rejecting and questioning caste hierarchy and caste-based inequality 2,500 years ago already, right? And who created this new religion based on 
the desire for a new kind of community, right? Uh, which would, which would accept men and women, which would accept members of different social classes, uh, and it was founded by this prince who gave up his um, his kingdom, who gave up his family, and who reinvented himself as a kind of brand new uh, person, a new kind of rational figure in the very depths of Indian history. That really appealed to Ambedkar, right? And he said, let us think about Buddhism as not only a religion of the past, but possibly a religion of the future, especially for Hindu untouchables. And um, he taught himself to read the entire Buddhist canon. He studied Pali, even wrote a dictionary of Pali, which is the language of, of, of ancient Indian Buddhism. Uh, and he reinterpreted the teachings of the Buddha for uh, a modern age. Now, those of you who are familiar with Buddhism know that the sort of foundations of, of the system uh, are the four noble truths, uh, so-called. Uh, the first of which is that we need to accept that there is suffering in the world. Right? There is the fact of suffering. There is the acknowledgement of suffering. There is a path to try to address and deal with our mortality, with our suffering. And finally, there is the capacity of humans through rational reflection, right? And through a realignment of their relationship with their own body, with other humans, with the community, and with any kind of larger uh, uh, power out there, there is the capacity to liberate ourselves from this endless cycle of mortality and suffering. Right? So you begin with the, the idea of suffering, and you have a promise of liberation. And Ambedkar worked with that. But he wanted to understand that suffering in terms of a social suffering, a collective suffering, a suffering that follows from being members of an unequal society. Inequality produces a peculiar form of collective suffering, which affects all of us. And therefore, entering into Buddhism is not just a personal choice of religious conversion. It can also be a political choice for an entire community right? to deal with the suffering endemic in any kind of situation of inequality. Right? So we've already adopted the precepts of liberty, equality, fraternity. But they have not delivered us from our suffering. Perhaps Buddhism can hold that promise of true liberation, right? of true freedom, not just political freedom, not just Swaraj, not just independence that we've already gotten in 1947, but a different conception of freedom, freedom from inequality itself. Right? This is something that Ambedkar wanted to work with. So as a sort of, not so much as a change of heart or a matter of faith, but really, as a political project, he sought to redefine um, the untouchable community, um, not as a caste or as outcasts or as you know part, parts of this sort of segregated and hierarchical Hindu society, but as a political community based on the idea of um, uh, uh, struggling for emancipation from the suffering that is engendered by inequality itself. Right? And he wrote this book. Um, he conducted the first mass conversion in the history of world Buddhism uh, in October 1956 uh, in a place called Nagpur. He took Buddhist vows, which he himself wrote. Um, he invited all these senior monks from different Southeast Asian countries, from Sri Lanka, from further east. Um, he had them make up this procedure of conversion, in a sense. Um, and about 400,000 untouchables, that very time, took those vows with him and became, were reborn from being untouchable Hindus. They were reborn as uh, what are called Navayana Buddhists. Navayana means the new vehicle, the new way, right? Uh, so as neo-Buddhists, as Ambedkarite Buddhists. Ambedkar was very sick, and he died six weeks later. And then there was another spate of conversions following on 
He hadn't even published his Buddhist Bible yet. It was published posthumously, this, this book that he wrote, The Buddha and His Dhamma, which is a reinterpretation of the Buddha's sermons for, for modern man. Um, but many people in the wake of his death converted. Um, and eventually the count of Ambedkar Buddhas stabilized at around um, uh, f uh, uh, you know, around four or five million. It has never, it has never actually it plateaued out by the end of the 1950s, and it has never significantly increased from that time to this. This is something worth thinking about, right? So, Ambedkar tried everything, right? Ambedkar tried non-cooperation and civil disobedience. He tried political representation and uh, minority status and separate electorates. He tried. Uh, you know, uh, scholarship, uh, historical investigations, polemical arguments through the study of the past, uh, rewriting uh, Indian history, cultural history, reading the classics, trying to understand what it is about Hindu scriptures that produces the caste system. He wrote the constitution. India became independent. He was the first law minister. He tried to introduce um, legislative change and create laws that would uh, ensure a certain kind of equality. He put affirmative action in its place uh, and instituted it as, as, as a regular form of, uh, of, of, of governance uh, for Indian democracy. He did everything before he finally thought to convert to Buddhism. Right? But you can imagine the arc of this journey and the degree of frustration and difficulty and repeated, in a sense, confrontation with a certain basic failure to persuade Indians that they really needed to put their money where their mouth was and to take equality seriously. That it wasn't even enough to be decolonized, it wasn't even enough to be democratic. It wasn't enough to have affirmative action. There was still something more that needed to be done before Indians began to understand that they could not treat fellow humans in the way that Dalits were treated. That they could not fundamentally hide behind their acceptance of diversity and difference and actually continue to practice hierarchy and inequality towards others who are different from you. Now, you know, India is very, very diverse. It's, it's been called the most diverse country in the world. It is very plural. It's also very inclusive, uh, traditionally. That may be changing now. Um, uh, and you learn to live with difference. Everybody is different from everybody else. There are the most languages spoken in India in any place in the world. There are the most religions practiced. Right? There are the most caste groups. There are all kinds of differences between Indians, all 1.2 billion of them. Right? Um, that people can deal with. But whether they are actually thinking about those who are different from them as being equal to them in some fundamental way, that is a problem that persists. Now, Ambedkar had picked up the idea from, you know, from the French and American revolutions he learned about liberty, equality, and fraternity. From John Dewey, his teacher, his American liberal pragmatist teacher way back at Columbia, whom he kept in touch with, by the way. Ambedkar was eventually given an honorary doctorate, uh, a delit, rather, more than a doctorate. Uh, uh, at, at Columbia in the 50s. And he and Dewey only died four years apart. Dewey died in 52, very old. Ambedkar died in his mid 60s and 56. They kept in touch, they kept corresponding. Um, and from him, he learned, or he made up the slogan, which was kind of influenced by Dewey um, educate, agitate, organize. Right? So the work of social pedagogy and social education had to continue along with the political project of, of, of decolonization and so on. That had to continue. Um, he reached out to women. Uh, he reached out to uh, families um, so that women would ensure that their children were educated. 
right? That you, you know, that, that, that untouchable society itself had to clean up its own act uh, and empower itself uh, uh, through education before it could even make that claim uh, for dignity and for equality. Um, but very importantly from Dewey, he got this idea of um, what Dewey called associational life and social endosmosis. Now you know what osmosis is. Osmosis is right when you have a membrane separating two different kinds of liquids, but they can pass through that membrane and they can mix, right? That is osmosis, right? So it's a kind of flow and interaction uh, between two different zones of different viscosity, right? Social endosmosis is the mixing of social groups in everyday life, right? And social endosmosis is what is precisely prevented by the fundamental law of caste, which is endogamy, that you always have to marry within caste. How is caste maintained? How is caste socially reproduced? But fundamental rule, you marry within caste, right? Then a whole set of associated rules. People across different castes, even today, but certainly in the beginning of the 20th century, did not eat together. They did not live together. They did not pray together. They did not drink from the same cup. Ambedkar was not allowed to sit with other students in the classroom, even though he was the most brilliant scholarship student of them all. He had to sit on the floor while they sat on benches and, and, and had desks. Right? He was not allowed to drink water during lunch break. Uh, he had to bring his own water or he had to go thirsty. Right? So this kind of extreme segregation is the opposite of what Dewey advocated as being a basic condition for democratic life, which is or for associational life, which is the actual interaction exchange between different communities, different groups, different castes, if you like, in Indian society. And the rules of endogamy, the rules of against commensality, against interdining, as it was called, eating together and so on, those absolutely prevented that. Even when Ambedkar was basically an advocate in the Bombay High Court, Somebody told me this recently, their grandfather was also a, this is a, a caste Hindu person, their grandfather was a colleague of Ambedkar's, uh, also a lawyer in, in the Bombay High Court, in the Bombay presidency before independence, that in the lunch break, during court cases where Ambedkar was arguing, I mean, making arguments, he had to sit separately with his tray of food. You know, this person with two and a half PhDs, more educated than any p p lawyer or any human in the entire Bombay presidency. Because at the end of the day, he could be the principal of the law college, he could be a professor, he could be a legislator, he could be a member of the Bom Bombay Legislative Assembly, but he was still an untouchable. right? So Ambedkar faced that in his own life. And this idea of Caste society, he, he, he once described it in one of his speeches as a tower with different floors, but no doors or windows. So you couldn't leave whatever floor you were on. You couldn't go up, you couldn't go down, you couldn't look out, you couldn't leave. You know, you had no idea what was going on with people at other levels. Um, and this kind of sense of being trapped in this extremely rigid, stratified social structure. Um, that was something that Ambedkar wanted to break down, what he called the annihilation of caste, is something that he wanted to uh, initiate somehow, somehow, by any means. He tried all these means, as I described to you. Right? Um, how are we doing for time? Almost out of time, right? I am out of time. Where's Tim? Yeah. Um, so, um, I, 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 there were a couple of things uh, that I wanted to mention. Um, I should have done that sooner. One was this very idea of Dalit identity, right? We don't use the word untouchable. As I told you, untouchability is, you know, it's like you don't use the N word in this country. It's like that. It's not, it's not, it's not a category that we, we think with or we work with anymore which doesn't mean that everything that follows from it 
doesn't actually exist in some form, but that's a different issue. The word used in Ambedkarite conceptions of social inequality and social justice is Dalit. Now, what does Dalit mean? Dalit literally means ground down or crushed, right? So it captures the kind of politics of anger, the rage, right? The rejection of the caste system by memorializing, by fetishizing the very uh, oppression that creates Dalit identity, right? Dalit, Dalit is crushed by very definition. That's what Dalit means, right? So to identify as Dalit um, implies a certain kind of political anger against what it means to live this life of, of, of being at the receiving end of extreme social inequality, right? Now, Gandhi used a different term. Gandhi had a very different conception of how to deal with inequality, how to deal with uh, uh, freedom, how to deal with mortality, with suffering, with all of the questions. And I've, I've written about this as well at, at length. Um, don't have time to get into it today. But the word he advised, and he coined in a sense, was Harijan. Harijan means, Hari is, is, is one of the names of God. Uh, and Jan means a person um, or, 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 or creature or child. So Harijan means a child of God, right? A creature of God, God's own creature, right? That's the term Gandhi used. Now this is a term which has all of the connotations of God's love. God loves everyone equally, both the meek and the strong, both the weak and the strong, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a term of Christian pity, of equality through love, right? Of embracing difference because in the eyes of God, all are equal, right? In a sense, it has the opposite sort of affective tone than Dalit, which means crushed. No child, no God, right? No love, no pity, no inclusion. Just anger at this existential condition of extreme oppression, right? And Gandhi and Ambedkar's quarrel with each other proceeded essentially along these lines, right? Um, that Gandhi felt that within Hindu society there could be a process of self-purification where caste Hindus would try to purge from their own consciousness the desire to do violence to untouchables, right? So it was part of his project of nonviolence. Right? Eliminate the violence that is inside you vis-a-vis -vis those who are weaker than you. Right? Purge yourself of these tendencies of oppression and of inequality. Think of everyone as being equally a child of God. Right? And you'll have a more healthy, a more egalitarian, a more loving, a more inclusive and solidaristic Hindu society. That was Gandhi's vision. Ambedkar's vision was not that. Ambedkar's vision was a political vision right, of needing to speak with self-respect. Not the self-purification of the caste Hindu, but the self-respect of the untouchable him or herself, right. Assertion of that claim of inalienable dignity and, and irreducible equality, right. And the memory, always remember, never forgive, never forget the kind of oppression that you have suffered that has made you um, the lowest of the low in this unequal world, right? You have to hold on to that memory in order to fuel the anger which will then drive the social struggle and the social transformation and the, the, the long fight, the long haul to equality, right? Um, eventually the word Harijan went completely out of use. Nobody uses it anymore. It's, it's, it's almost thought badly of. The word Dalit has remained. Uh, as part of the politics of, of, of the struggle for equality, which continues in many ways in Indian society. And Ambedkarite Buddhists actually um, fluctuate between identifying as Dalit and identifying as Buddhists. Because in some senses, Buddhism creates a new set of potentialities as far as their identity is concerned, where they can even consider leaving behind the stigma of caste. Right. So if you're going to continue to be Dalit even after you've converted, 
uh, what's the point, right? Uh, so, so you know, in, in a sense, you can start fresh as a Buddhist. Um, but nonetheless, as Ambedkar eyed Buddhists, you know, that, that, that history of political struggle is still inscribed within that identity as well. Now, I'll just stop uh, because I've spoken for so long. Um, I wanted actually to tell you about um, some experiments with equality that I've been observing uh, uh, sort of as a, uh, as a set of campaigns that I've been writing about and observing in southern India lately, but I don't have time to do that. Um, I wanted to talk more about this idea of social endosmosis. What's it like for people of different castes of different communities to actually mingle, right? How do people interact when they're not used to interacting in intimate ways, right? And what happens to attitudes when people are thrown into situations of proximity that they're actually allowed to go without sometimes in their entire life because of the way in which um, we're allowed to live um, segregated lives, we're allowed to turn a blind eye, we're allowed to know uh, to, to not know really what others are living and going through and suffering, right? I wanted to tell you um, more about how that works in real time, but I won't do that. But I do want to say at the end, and this is, this is you know, slightly different, but it is related, that um, the India that Ambedkar helped to create was by definition egalitarian, based on an idea or an ideal, at least, of fraternity and solidarity. And premised on democratic principles of equal respect, equal rights, equal dignity for all, regardless of sex, regardless of community, regardless of caste, and regardless of religion. Right? What you're seeing in India now is an increasingly majoritarian politics, right? Majoritarianism is the direct opposite of equality, right? The very fundamental principle of equality is that you cannot have majorities and minorities, that we are all equal citizens regardless of our religious identity, regardless of our caste group, and regardless of other vectors of identity with which we may um, affiliate or with which we may identify ourselves, right? So majoritarianism suggests greater concentration of power with a group precisely because it is numerically a larger group, right? Mm -hmm. And religious nationalism tends to push even a liberal democratic republic like India in that direction. And this is something that Ambedkar would have had a problem with, I think. Uh, of course, his primary focus was on caste, right? But the two things are not unrelated. Religious identity and caste identity are both ways of organizing Indian society, and both are equally important, and both work together. So any kind of majoritarianism ultimately is going to work against any kind of weak, vulnerable, or minoritized group, whether it is Dalits, whether it is Muslims, whether it is any other kind of minority, right? And so as India commits itself to maintaining its democracy and continues to be proud of its electoral stability and its diversity uh, and its inclusiveness um, and continues to pay homage to a figure like Ambedkar, um, keeping that in mind that his struggle was always for equality, that is also something that gives us um, fuel uh, to fight against the forces of majoritarianism. At least that's how I see it. So I'll leave it there, and I'm happy to take questions.
the, the title you say, Ambedkar and his struggle with India. Yeah. Was he really struggling with India or he was struggling within India? Mm -hmm. In my opinion, he fought for India. Mm -hmm. He struggled for India mm -hmm. to make India free from British Raj. Mm -hmm. I'll accept that he has problem mm -hmm. within Indian society, mm -hmm. within Hindu society. Mm -hmm. But I don't think he was struggling against mm -hmm. India. I don't know whether you have put it deliberate to provoke discussion on this issue, mm -hmm. but this is my opinion. Even if Dr. Ambedkar comes and appear here today, he will ask you, why are you saying this? I was not struggling against India. He remained Indian, although he turned into Buddhism, and a lot of Hindus will feel Buddhism part of Hinduism, no matter what Buddhists think. This is the beauty of Hinduism. So my humble feeling is this, this word that he was struggling with India is really entirely wrong and misleading. Thank you. Uh, do you want me to say something? Yeah. No, I mean, I put that word there with great, a great deal of thought and uh, deliberately so uh, because as I tried to say in the beginning I mean with is not against right so I, I, I'm not I, I don't quite understand how you would say that with means against with means the opposite of against actually uh, but in any case uh, I put the word there because as I explained in the beginning there was an external project of gaining political independence against British rule. So that was a struggle against British Empire, right? But there was also an internal struggle to render Indian society more egalitarian. And that was indeed a struggle that Ambedkar had to have with Indian society as a whole. And I described many different stages of that struggle, many different paths that he tried to take with the fact that this remained recalcitrant, intransigent, and was not yielding to the principle of equality, despite many different kinds of approaches that he and others adopted, right? So it was a struggle with India, right? It was trying to come to terms with the fact that there was something about Indian society, even as it was going through massive transformations and changes, right? Even as it was open to improvement, it was still not yielding on this question of social inequality, not in the way that it needed to, according to him. And that struggle continued to his dying day. It continued to his dying day and it continues to today. So I would, I would stand by that word, actually. And I, I'm glad it provoked you, actually. Yeah, That's a good thing. <laughs> OK, sure. <laughs> um, we agree to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you see any heirs to Ambedkar's thought in India today? And sort of the second part of the same question, what about the Dalit leaders who I suspect he would not have been very happy with, like Mayawati or somebody like that? Um, so do you, do you see sort of a legacy of this in Indian politics today? You know, I think that <coughs> both Ambedkar and Gandhi have been absorbed into the political DNA of post-colonial India. You know, you may not see any Gandhians out there identifying themselves as such, but the very way in which we understand politics, certain kind of politics of protest, of dissent, of resistance, uh, certain kind of principles of nonviolent politics and so on, which you see in the social movements, which you see in, uh, you know, environmental movements, you see in all kinds of uh, you know, not directly uh, in, in, in politics as such, but you see in all arenas of uh, social struggle, can only be described as being essentially Gandhian, having learned a great deal and absorbed a great deal from everything that Gandhi had to teach. Similarly with Ambedkar, right? Now, I think the fact that it's now taken as, a, as common sense that we really cannot have caste be a principle of social differentiation and social hierarchy, right? However we deal with it, there's a total disagreement on that. But the fact that it's accepted as a given that caste has either already gone away or that it needs to go away, right? Or that we need to have programs of social justice in order to rectify the 
problems created by caste over a very long time. The fact that that is universally accepted, it's, 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 not, it's, it's, not, it's not something that anybody is going to stand up and defend caste anymore, right? Just like you will not really have anybody defending uh, racial, uh, uh, you know, racism anymore. Well, I, I, and I shouldn't say anymore in the year 2017 about anything. However, uh, you know, uh, cer certain kind of basic democratic common sense would lead us to believe that in that sense, Ambedkar's agenda is very much alive and kicking. Now, you've had what is called caste politics uh, in many different Indian states, in many different regions. You've had many movements produce certain kind of political parties, uh, certain new, f new phase of electoral politics where parties enter into the fray as caste-based parties, as appealing to caste communities as their primary voters. You see that in the southern states, especially in Tamil Nadu. You see that in uh, UP. You see that in Bihar. You see that in Punjab. You see that you know all over the all over the country. Um, and the leaders of those parties, um, many times emerging from popular Dalit movements, which are regionally quite uh, distinct and which have different histories. You know, and some Dalit movement in Karnataka looks very different from Dalit movement in Punjab, and so on, right? And you have a number of these leaders, some of whom are more of a political description, some of whom are in active politics, some of whom are more religious leaders. You know, you have a number of these figures. But there really isn't any one person, right, who creates an all India Dalit politics, uh, which, which can then enjoy a certain kind of leverage when it comes time to form governments and so on. People don't vote as Dalits all over India. You know, they vote by a particular caste group. They vote according to their locality. And they vote for particular figures. They don't necessarily have a party that they can go to in that sense. Um, but actually, this is something that flows from Ambedkar's own fortunes. He was not a very successful politician ever. right? He would, he would lose elections. He was never a popular leader. Unlike all of the other leaders of, of both the Congress and the Muslim League, as well as the left parties and many other parties in India. You know, I mean, in some, some sense, he was a scholar and an intellectual, right? I mean, he had ideas about mass politics, but he was not a very successful mobilizer uh, in the same way that Gandhi was. You know, millions of people did not follow him, even in his lifetime, right? His influence was slow to spread outside the region of Maharashtra and the state of Maharashtra. Right? Even Ambedkarite Buddhism has not extended really beyond the Mahar community primarily within Maharashtra, and not even to other Dalit groups, non-Mahars, within Maharashtra itself. Right? So he travels intellectually, you know, and he travels in terms of all that he has to say. Uh, you know, as a historian, as a scholar, as a political theorist, as a philosopher, as a polemicist, as a classicist, but he doesn't travel so well politically. Uh, and this is true even today. So in that sense, working with his legacy doesn't necessarily get anybody any votes, you know. And a lot of Dalit leaders have to make up their own politics in order to, to win the votes, including Mayavati or Kanchi Ram or any of the you know southern leaders, um, any number of figures, but I think it's it's it you know it's it, it, it's a work in progress, and this will change over time. Yeah. yeah. So today, with the regional communities fighting for the, I mean, carrying out the agitation. Yeah. Uh, for the inclusion of their community for the reservations in yeah. India. Yeah. And at the same time, the youth of India who is looking for the development for their own, for their life. Yeah. How far the segregation of this past system is from the dilution, from your perspective? Uh, Okay. okay. That is, is it being diluted or not? No, I, I mean, how far uh, this. Uh, the question of the caste system is important in the field over there. I definitely agree with that there is this caste system in the India right now. But what is the importance of that when, uh, you know, like there are two different uh, bodies uh, emerging out of India right now, like one regional uh, communities which are fighting for their inclusion in the reservations, like the Jerks in Haryana or the Pati Yeah, yeah. And at the same time, there is the youth of India. 
everyone knows that India is a young nation, and all of the dream, I mean the, the dream and desire yeah. of these people. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. So what 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 this question is referring to is, is a series of agitations that we've seen uh, in the last couple of years, uh, where um, so-called other backward castes, right, which is a kind of uh, sort of bureaucratic terminology uh, of, of 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 classifying um, uh, backward groups uh, in terms of their um, um, eligibility for reservations, for affirmative action, right? Um, many different groups which are actually socially and historically powerful, but nonetheless qualify as being backward according to some socioeconomic criteria in education. criteria are basically asking for more reservations and in order to to be granted those more reservations those, those those reservations they have to prove that they're actually more backward than they are right so you find this peculiar situation or kind of reverse um, uh, set of claims where instead of so what is happening is that this is part of the pathology of, of you know a certain kind of affirmative action that essentially what is the, the perception is that the only way you can get anything from the state is if you qualify as having certain disabilities, right? If you can prove that you're backward enough, or that you're poor enough, or that you're illiterate enough, or that you need the help, then you'll get the help. And that's the only way you can get ahead. Because it's so unequal that, you know, without that help, you're never going to be able to get the job, you're never going to be able to get the education. You cannot lay claim to those resources which are available to potentially everyone, right? Because you have some weakness, there's not enough weakness to qualify uh, for affirmative action, right? So you have a lot of socially not so weak groups trying to agitate and saying to the state, please recognize us as being really, really in need of your help, right? Even if that means actually demoting themselves and their self-description of their social status, of their levels of, 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 of privilege and so on, right? So it's, it's trying to game the system, uh, uh, it, it, you know, through this kind of new politics of representation. And I think it would have horrified Ambedkar because the point was to get within 10 years, originally as, as foreseen, right? Or at least at some foreseeable point, to get to the point where nobody would need reservations. Not that more and more and more groups would need reservations, because it's, it's just too difficult to make it in such an unequal society, right? Where unless you have the extreme privileges of birth, right, inherited resources of various kinds, cultural capital, social power, political power, you are really never going to make it, right? So you have to petition the state. In order to petition the state, you have to show yourself to be, um, you know, worse off than perhaps empirically you could be shown to be, you know, ju judging by other kinds of criteria, some kind of objective criteria, these can be found. So you now have caste politics entering that stage Right? We've already gone through a stage where we have these new caste-based parties and people are going into elections voting for those parties, but it's still not enough, right? The state is still, you know, putting you out to pasture and leaving you out to, you know, in the cold, right? So then you have this new kind of politics now which you find. And I think this is also driven, by the way, by the overall tendency towards majoritarianism, right? So the only way to organize yourself into a viable political entity, right, is by trying to increase your numbers, increase your self-representation, and put forward your claims in certain ways, right, which will then allow you to access some portion of whatever the state has to offer, right? It's not an egalitarian society. It's not a society where, you know, you can go in like everybody else and get what you deserve through the dint of your labor or through the dint of your, you know, uh, effort. 
that's not going to happen. You need these other mechanisms. So it's, it's, it's one of those distortions that you're beginning to see. Uh, and it's becoming more and more, um, it's becoming more and more, you know, palpable and, and frequent where you have these not so backward groups um, agitating to be uh, included in rosters of backwardness, of greater backwardness. Normally, I take the last question, but I'm going to let you take the last question. There's, there's one over here as well, I think. And there's many over there. <laughs> uh, there's one more question. Um, Go ahead, yeah. My question is that it has been 70 years that yeah. India has been independent, and uh, there's a reservation system going on. Yes. And uh, the definition of Dalit, as you said, is the person crushed and low and on the ground, and he has to be given a reservation, and given opportunity to rise and become equal with the society. Yeah. And I'm practically seeing that thousands of Dalits today are millionaires, and multi-millionaires, and in powerful positions. And uh, when it comes to the reservation system, their kin apply for the reservation, they get it. On the other hand, are Hindu who's from the upper caste, is poor, and same level yeah. of education. He's not selected, but the multi-millionaire son is selected just because he's Dalit. Yeah, but you know, it's it's kind of, I mean, it's a little bit like, you can have President Barack Obama and still not have, you know. Just continuation my question. How long this reservation system will I I understand the because question. The British were not responsible for this. In yes. Reality, you know. Yes, but if you look at racial inequality in this country, right, the pro the, the problem is not solved by those one thousand millionaires. Just like the problem in America for African Americans was not solved by having a black president, right? It's not enough. It's not enough. Well, reservations are absolutely essential because if you still, you know, if you go into the classroom. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher. Despite reservations, there are not enough students that who are scheduled caste or scheduled tribes. There are not enough faculty who are scheduled caste, scheduled caste. You don't have enough diplomats. You don't have enough lawyers. You don't have enough doctors. You don't have, proportionate to this population, right? And given the promises that are made by the Indian Constitution and by the Indian democratic system, there is nowhere near the kind of participation. There is nowhere near the kind of equality that it may be better than it was a generation or two ago, but it is not at all at the point where you can say, let's dismantle this entire system of positive discrimination. Which Dalits should be excluded from this option? Well, I think there are there are complicated. Yes, but I mean, the, the, this is such an outlier as a problem, and so minor in the scheme of of the you know the, the gigantic scale of the problem, where most Dalits are also dirt poor, most Dalits are also the ones who are not going to be educated at all. They have the worst indicators of maternal mortality, of infant mortality, of malnutrition, right? On and on and on. You pile up different forms of social, economic, and political deprivation, right? And one or a thousand or a hundred thousand millionaires is not the answer to the problem. The answer to the problem is that fundamentally, there is an entire section of the society that is not on that bandwagon of development, growth, India shining, etc. And it's not getting there fast enough for where it needs to be going. One more question. Get the mic back there. Um, yeah. I, know, I know you mentioned that Asian caste politics have gotten through changes, those conversations have and have, but it's never enough. Now, the whole world is going through this resurgence of nationalism. Yeah. But India itself, my dad, he was born in 1958, he moved to Kuwait, and I was born in Kuwait and came here. So, my whole idea of India was this nationalist sentiment that were, you know, previous people said. I never knew anything else about India. So I went over there in 2010. Now, as we go through this new religious nationalism, how do you see that like, either stopping in place or affecting that caste politics right now with the whole new nationalism? 
Well, you know, actually we've seen a great spurt in violence against Dalits uh, in, in the last few years. Um, you know, you've seen lynchings, you've seen um, incidents of, uh, uh, you know, uh, immolations, of rape, of uh, various kinds of uh, attacks, not only on Dalits, but also on minorities. But uh, that seems to be the direction in which this bellicose nationalism is going, right? That nationalism is about closing your ranks, right? And it's about asserting certain kinds of power and pride, which excludes the weak, right? So neo-nationalism, and, and you, you're seeing this in the right turn all across the world, right? This is, this is an age of reaction, right? Right from what, you know, what is happening with immigrants and refugees in Europe to, you know, what is going on in the United States post the current, you know, the, the, the most recent election um, to what is going on in places like India and Turkey, you know, the, a certain kind of majoritarian authoritarian nationalism is basically always going to hurt those who are already weak and vulnerable, right? And in India, that a big part of that is, is Dalits and another big part of that is Muslims. So nationalism is not good, right, for those who do not claim to be the nation themselves. Um, and I think we're going to see greater violence in, 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 in coming years if things continue this way, I'm sorry to say. I want to uh, thank you. And I was, you sort of finished on my note. I was going to say, this you talk in many ways, kind of resonates to some extent on a, on a global scale. And, and I thank you for that. But let's give uh, Nani a big hand.